Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, a proposal to stop invasive carp from taking over Minnesota's waterways gets a hearing in the Senate, and a key lawmaker offers his views. Plus, Governor Walls tours the BCA and touts law enforcement efforts to solve violent crime. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. The Mississippi River, the wild and scenic St. Croix River, the Minnesota River, not to mention habitat, ecology, tourism, and the economy, would all be impacted if invasive carp are able to gain a foothold in Minnesota. The Senate Environment Committee held an informational hearing this week to review the state's options. From my perspective, today's question is really very simple. Does the state of Minnesota want to step up and do something and stop these carp or not? We're at the point uh, where there's no plan B. There is a plan A. I'll talk about it today. It's not perfect. It's feasible. It's possible. It has a great chance of succeeding. To not act is a choice in and of itself because if they do start reproducing, which could happen almost at any time, given the numbers in Minnesota waters, there are no options to control them except removal and this is what's happening in the Illinois River right now at the cost of a couple million dollars a year, and it's not controlling them, it's just keeping them status quo. This is the only plan on the table. And once they get past lock into M5, I don't know what options you have. I, no one has any options anywhere other than to hire commercial fishermen for a few million dollars to remove fish um, and, uh, that, and make fertilizer out of them at great cost. So we have folks that have never experienced the Riverway coming out and really enjoying our national treasure. All that will stop if the, cop, if the carp actually get here. So I, I really implore you to, to heed the warning that the others have, have uh, laid out on the table and protect our, our nation's first wild and scenic national park. Minnesota DNR is absolutely committed to invasive carp prevention and management, and we are very supportive of finding new solutions to manage invasive carp. Um, and we're really grateful for our robust partnerships we have with folks in the room today. And we want to continue to review potential solutions with all of these partners, including Lock and Dam Number Five, because I think we all just want to find the best solution for Minnesota. Joining me now in the studio is the chair of the Senate Environment and Natural Resources Finance Committee, Senator Bill Ingebrigtsen. Thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. What prompted you to convene a hearing on invasive carp? Well, I just read another article in the, uh, and I forget what article it was, it was in the Tribune or someplace that, that uh, there was a, uh, uh, another carp found getting closer and closer to the uh, state of Minnesota and, and uh, uh, the groups uh, are uh, becoming more concerned and, and being part of this, this process back in 2011 when Governor Dayton first had an actual carp summit. Uh, it was very clear that at that time people were concerned about these flying carp coming up and getting into our lakes and waters in Minnesota and what kind of devastation that they would do. And then it seemed to kind of go off to the side. Nobody's been paying a whole lot of attention to it. Uh, the, the DNR has been monitoring it, doing this and that. Uh, we expended, I think, $5 million from the Legacy Committee to, uh, to have uh, Dr. Peter Sorensen, uh, a fish specialist, to, to do the research as to how, to how to prevent them from coming to Minnesota instead of just managing them when they get here. And uh, that has finally now come to an end. There can be no more science, at least that's what's been said. And we need to move forward. Uh, speaking of Dr. Peter Sorensen, uh, he said Minnesota is almost a bubble in that surrounding states do have the carp investing their waterway or infesting their waterways, but not quite Minnesota. If it were to gain a foothold in Minnesota, what would be the impact? Well, I think it would be terrible. It would be a financial impact on, on the recreation. Uh, obviously, the testifiers, the uh, more scientists even said, and Peter Sorensen himself said, <clears throat> the fisheries would be affected. I mean, these are these are huge things for Minnesota. Where Minnesota is known as a jewel when it comes to uh, lakes, waters, and streams, recreation, fishing, and if and if these flying carp, who can actually come out of the water six to nine feet uh, when agitated, uh, it becomes not only not only does it hurt the, uh, the the ecology of the of the of the river, it's a it's a public safety issue. Uh, we have the most boats in the country, and and uh, people that will be boating will 
will, uh, you know, in the worst case scenario, have to wear helmets. My goodness, we can do something about this and we need to do it now. You mentioned that the Department of Natural Resources has been monitoring carp since about 2012. They've contracted with commercial fishers to, uh, to help manage them, to capture some of them. In your view, have the DNR's efforts thus far been adequate? No, I don't think they have. I, I, th I think, you know, if it's been a funding situation, then, then I guess we need, to, we need to address that. They need to come to the legislature with a, with a little more of a serious face, if you will. This year's governor's budget did not include this. Uh, so I'm not sure that the DNR is conveying to the administration what, what this could potentially turn into if we don't deal with it. And now with a, with a surplus that we do have, uh, it seems like it's certainly the time to go ahead and do this. Uh, the cost of it is, you know, uh, fairly expensive, but at the same time, when you start talking about property damage, uh, property uh, 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 going down and devaluating uh, through counties along the river and getting into our lakes and streams, it's pennies compared to what we can lose. So we need, we need to move, we need to move quick. Testifiers at today's hearing said that Minnesota faces a choice. We can stop them now, and there's a proposal we'll talk about in a moment, or we can spend lots of dollars managing them in the future, pointing out that once the fish becomes established, it cannot be eradicated. Is the situation this dire? I think it is, and if, and if you think back of the, uh, the, the invasive species that we are now monitoring, trying to control, whether the zebra mussel, curly leaf pondweed, uh, milfoil, and now the, uh, there's another terrible one coming, uh, it's called a starry stonewort. Uh, by not dealing with it head on immediately, right away, we end up spending tons and tons of money, millions of dollars, lake associations, cities, counties, on all this, trying to maintain and trying to, trying to hold it back. We have an opportunity here to stop one of the most devastating invasive species. We should step up and do it, and do it right now. So the proposal that, that the committee heard today would modify Lock and Dam number five, which is near Lake Pepin. Uh, it was testified that this is an ideal location, um, and it would also include the installation of a bioacoustic fish fence to stop the invasive carp from being able to move any further north. What are your thoughts on this approach? I like it, I like it. The engineering has been, uh, been already accomplished with the dollars that have been expended. Uh, the uh, sound barrier, the barrier actually has been, has been now tested and working. Uh, it works in, in, I believe it's the state is Kentucky right now. They're, they're just now starting to put together uh, some statistics on how well it's working. <clears throat> but nevertheless, we don't have time. Uh, the, the scientist that's been working on this for years, and he's a renowned fish scientist, Dr. Peter Sorensen from the University of Minnesota, says there is no more science. We, have, we don't have to do any more research. The research is done. The, something has to be done now or we will be, we will be infested before long. Governor Walls has said on more than one occasion that he is in favor of a special session, maybe yet this year, uh, to do something with that $9 billion surplus that the state still has. If there were to be a special session, would you try to garner some funding for this proposal to, to solidify lock and dam number five and prevent, hopefully, carp from getting any further north? You know, I would, and, and there's talk about, well, who's gonna pay for it? Is it gonna be Minnesota? Is it gonna be Wisconsin? Is it gonna be the federal government? You know, quite frankly, I don't care who pays for it. It all comes out of the same pocket at one time or another. Uh, we need to get it done, and if we have to collect some money, put the hand out afterwards <clears throat> to do that, we'll go right ahead and do that. Uh, I'm a little taken back that the governor hasn't taken this a little more serious uh, and asked for it in his budget. He did not ask for this particular uh, situation you know, to, for funding in the, in the budget. But yes, if it, if it comes down to a special session, and, and we know this is my last one, or this is my last year, I will definitely ask. In fact, I'm gonna follow up with the governor and the governor's office, as well as the DNR commissioner, uh, and, and get together and meet with these people and, and get this moving forward. You can't just, okay, we had another meeting, now we're not gonna do anything. This has to be done. Well, and to that end, Senator Scott Dibble, who sits on the committee and is a member of the DFL party, was also in favor of this. He, he yes, indicated he that yeah. everybody should work together on this. Yeah, he knows prevention, and, he's, and I agree with him, 100%. Prevention is better than, than reacting after something has happened, and, and then it's just controlling, trying to control, trying to control. And these things aren't gonna be controllable. They're, they're, gonna, they're gonna rot our whole system, and we just don't want that. 
Now you mentioned that this is your last year. Yeah. And so I've got you in the hot seat and I get yeah. to ask you, um, just a retrospective, you were elected to the Minnesota Senate in 2006, following a career in law enforcement that included your position as Douglas County Sheriff for I think 16 years. You have devoted your adult life to service. And so as you prepare for this next step, when you look back on your Senate career, what will you be proud of? What will you remember fondly? Well, I think politically I will, I will remember the, the uh, fact that uh, being a Republican, that um, the Republican was, uh, the Senate had been controlled by the, uh, by the Democrats for over 40 years. And in starting my second term in the Senate, we actually for, took control for the first time, was 11 and 12. Then we lost it again for four years, and then we've had it uh, back and forth. So of the 16 years that I have been in the Senate, the Republicans have uh, been in control of the Senate, which is quite a trend, quite a, it's quite a change. So I, you know, I can be part of that, uh, what I think is uh, success when it comes to politics, in Minnesota especially. Uh, but as far as what have I uh, done and accomplished, uh, sometimes you think back of what are the things that I feel, at least in my district, that I have stopped from, from happening, uh, whether it be uh, you know, a $10 million amendment that made no sense whatsoever to me, uh, being part of the process of stopping that, or something as simple as uh, this last, um, last session when, <clears throat> when I was able to do something for special needs people uh, to actually get them to get the, uh, the vaccination quicker. Uh, because I do have a 63-year-old uh, brother-in-law that lives with me that's Down syndrome, and it just seemed right that those folks should be concluded with the people that were at high risk, because they are at high risk. And to be able to move that along, that kind of, that kind of thing is very rewarding to me. And then, of course, my public safety uh, career, uh, uh, being part of that and, and uh, uh, being here to, to advise like we do as a citizen legislature, it's been just nothing but a, nothing but a true honor. Senator Bill Egbertson, it has been an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <music> Members of the Capitol Press Corps were recently invited to tour St. Paul's Bureau of Criminal Apprehension Facility for a demonstration of the forensic processes used on firearms retrieved from crime scenes. Following the tour, the governor and law enforcement officials spoke about how the state is handling the uptick in violent crime and the need for increased funding. We heard it time and time again at dozens of stops, invest money in us and invest money in the BCA and the researchers and the investigators, and we will bring down these numbers. And that is proving to be true. So I have to tell you, we, we asked the legislature to invest $300 million with great fungibility for local control. We still need to do that. We still need to make that case. Starting in 2019, we asked for an enhanced ability to be able to tie these crimes together through the Fusion Center. We asked for an increase of approximately two dozen state patrol officers. And we asked in the bonding bill for an extension of this office in a field office of the BCA to take some of the pressure off that you're going to hear from Commissioner Harrington and Superintendent Evans about just the sheer backlog of things that happen and how that slows down. You're also going to hear that in many cases, the sense of urgency about finding and getting, uh, making sure that there's accountability for people who are committing these crimes but so many times these are tied to multiple crime scenes with one or two individuals that the sooner we're able to process them, it's not just making an impact on a crime that's already been committed, it's stopping those future crimes from being committed by getting those perpetrators off the streets. Reverend King once noted that it, we are caught in that inescapable network of mutuality. What affects one person individually affects us all. And, and literally that's how public safety in the state has worked. Whether it is state patrol going out doing heat and working on reducing speeding, which was at an atrocious level, more, more recent reports, 125 and a 60. Um, that's insane. Uh, and the sudden stop when that happens, we've seen the consequences in the, the rise in fatal crashes. Uh, the BCA's efforts to try and impact investigations through investigations and proactive policing to try and take guns off the streets. Uh, the governor noted, and I, and I will take off script a little bit to say, we have a need for speed uh, because 
the speed with which we take a bad guy off the street, the speed with which we take a gun off the street means that a payback shooting, a revenge shooting, a consequence of gang activity can't happen if the bad guy is already in custody and if his gun is already in lockdown. We have to increase the speed with which we hold people accountable in order to keep people safe because it, in fact, it is a prevention method that way. A leading figure from Minnesota's territory days through its early statehood is Henry Hastings Sibley, the state's first governor. Brian Pease of the Minnesota Historical Society tells us more. Henry Sibley played a significant role in Minnesota history. He served as the territory's first representative in Congress. Of the territory of Minnesota, he was Minnesota's first governor. He helped frame the state's constitution, and he had a good relationship with the Dakota people when he worked in fur trading. How did Henry Sibley come to call Minnesota home? He started out as a young man coming to Minnesota as a representative of the American Fur Company. He was 23 years old when he was given the responsibility to be kind of the representative of the headquarters for that uh, fur company in Minnesota. And so he, you know, built a house in the 1830s eventually across from historic Fort Snelling and um, really became an iconic figure for not only the people that were coming into visiting, you know, visit what would have been Minnesota at that time, and also had a strong relationship with a lot of the native people, especially the Dakota people that he was working with to get the furs back into uh, his company. Henry Sibley had a relationship with a native woman and that produced a daughter. Her name was Helen. Um, his work also with fur trading dealt with a lot of Native American people. How did those relationships influence his views? Well, I think he was living in both worlds because you know the, his customers were the Dakota people or any, anyone else that was bringing in the supplies and the goods that he wanted, you know, especially the fur. And so um, he would spend time with a lot of Dakota people out hunting, going on expeditions. You know, he's pretty well known for, you know, his relationship with the Dakota people. In fact, his nickname was Walker in the Pines. And so, you know, they accepted him as, you know, almost one of them. But of course, as more people move in into, you know, colonize or take over the land, you have to divide your loyalty to, well, I'm, I'm a white person, so I want to talk about more about the influences I have with that population because the Dakota people or other native people, you know, they're important, but they're not, by the 1840s and 50s, the fur companies are kind of losing their popularity. Fur companies are losing business. And so it's like we kind of have to move on from that chapter into the next chapter of Minnesota's history. This part of the United States was undergoing great change. What did the territory look like in 1851, about a decade after the failure of the American Fur Company? It was uh, expanding rapidly. Uh, you have the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux, which Henry Sibley had a vested interest in. Um, a lot of the Dakota, by the time of those treaties in 1851, were in an incredible debt to the American fur companies. And so as these treaties take place, the traders are insisting that they get a payment of that treaty to pay off those existing debts. And so that, you know, complicates some of the interactions he had with Dakota leaders because they felt they were being cheated out, out of some of their money. But in, in the, you have to look at this idea that people are progressing. And so either you're progressing with this or you're part of the problem. And so Dakota people were in the way. So we have to take that, you know, buy that land, purchase that land and put them on reservations. And then hopefully they become acculturated and become part of our civilization. And that leads to a lot of resistance, obviously, because people are not always willing to bend to the will of, of a greater power or, a, you know, a group of people saying you have to be this way. Sibley was sworn in as governor in May of 1858, just days after the state officially became a state. What were some of his accomplishments as governor? Not a lot in the sense of, you know, two years isn't a lot of time. Um, that was the standard until all the way up to the 1960s. Governors only served two-year terms. 
And so um, he was elected in October of 1857, so he didn't quite have two full years, but he, he was one of those governors that um, was faced with all kinds of economic hardships within the new territory and the new state of Minnesota. So he ended up that first year as a governor um, with a $5 million loan debacle, which was uh, the constitutional creators decided in the Constitution, the state can only borrow $250,000. So you can't lend out more than $250,000. Well, they wanted these railroads so, so badly in Minnesota to help the prosperity and the progress that they decided to change the Constitution just months after it was adopted by this, the citizen, citizens of the new state of Minnesota. So they um, got the legislature to you know, make that Constitution amendment passed, the public voted for it to pass, and so they started trying to give out these certificates to these railroad companies, which at the same time there was an economic panic, one of the great panics of American history where everything, all the investments that were brought into Minnesota got sucked out almost immediately. So the bottom line was they, they gave these companies these loans for $5 million and only a few miles of railroad were ever built. So that was a debt we had to pay off until the 1880s. And so that really st strapped Sibley as a governor trying to kind of rectify that, that horrible situation. So what happened as a result of that is his political opponents, opponents kind of tried to paint him into a corner that he was uh, in fault for all, or at fault for all these uh, kind of hindrances to pro Minnesota's progress. And he was actually against it. And so he was even fighting you know, releasing these bonds to these companies, but the court overruled him. And so, so that's kind of his legacy as the $5 million loan. But, you know, you, you can credit him. We have our La Toile du Nord, our Star of the North symbol, and our state model. That's something that he created with the idea that we can be a guiding light for other states to follow. So, so as for accomplishments, there really was a lot he, he was able to do in that two-year time period. So. Both Henry Sibley and Alexander Ramsey ran for governor for the first, you know, gubernatorial election. Henry Sibley won. How did that impact their relationship? When Alexander Ramsey was the first territorial governor, when he came to Minnesota, he had no place to stay. So he, uh, Henry Sibley invited him to stay at his house until they could find a place for him to live in St. Paul. And so they were political, you know, antagonists for many, many years. In fact, uh, that first, uh, state election for governor, uh, Sibley and Ramsey were competing against each other and Sibley only won by 240 votes. So it was a really close election and there was of course allegations of fraud and that type of stuff and probably was. But it's one of those things um, where I thought, you know, they were political opponents but I think they had a relationship, a friendship. In fact, when the U.S. Dakota War began, Alexander Ramsey came to Henry Sibley's house and said, I need you to lead these troops because you're the you know, most skilled at working with these Dakota people because you had engaged and interacted them, with them for decades. And so we need you to help put down this, uh, this war that's taking place in Minnesota. Eventually they were able to um, end the war. Uh, Chief Little Crow at that time was pushed out and his followers left with him. But, um, as part of that conversation of what do we do with the people who were considered uh, peaceful or really didn't have a role in that, um, they were put in at a camp at Fort Snelling, basically a concentration camp, and some people say an internment camp, just because by virtue of that war taking place, they were going to abrogate their treaty. They're basically saying, you did all these bad things, now you can no longer live here. So they were exiled from the state of Minnesota eventually. So he was a proponent of that. He was pro a proponent when they did these military trials, trials of hanging over 300 men that were part of those battles or alleged, you know, people who were killing people, white people in particular. And so, you know, he was, I think, you know, part of the idea that justice has to be served and based on what I've heard, these people are guilty, even though Historians have argued since those days that the trials that were conducted for the Dakota people were not fair, and it's pretty evident that that was the case. But he was in that situation of people were asking for justice in Minnesota. We have 600, and you know, at that time they thought it was 1,000 people killed, and it's like, where's the justice? 
somebody has to pay the, the penalty for all these deaths. And so that's kind of the emotion that was generating throughout the state of Minnesota. Someone has to pay for that. And so the Dakota men that were found guilty were the, the best choice for that, op, you know, that, that opportunity for frontier justice. But the other part, Lincoln weighed in and said, a lot of these guys were just participants in battles, so why would I execute them? There's no, no reason to do that. So that's where they, from the 303 you know, deemed um, of capital crimes, uh, that, was, that list was pared down to 38. And so that's, and unfortunately for Minnesota, that's the largest mass execution in U.S. history in our state, and that was in 1862. So. Much of Henry Sibley's contributions were made outside of public office, but are they still significant? Oh, absolutely. You know, he was the first territorial delegate in 1851 for the Minnesota Territory. Um, he was an early founder of, you know, our state, basically one of those guys who was part of the Constitutional Convention. So, you know, he got his political experience in the 1850s up until, you know, after, you know, Politically, he was pretty much done after 1860, but he was a member of the community of St. Paul. He was the president of the St. Paul Gas Company. He was, you know, the part of the Board of Regents for the U of M. So yeah, he, I think his legacy was, part of it was he was one of those first people here, first European American, Anglo-American people here. So he kind of paved the road for the, what would happen in Minnesota in the future just because of his you know, working with the Dakota people, being an important part of uh, kind of the political atmosphere in the early, early history. And so I think that tends to be romanticized. And you, you always think of all these great accomplishments that he did have, and we can't take that away from him. He did have these accomplishments, but like we've talked about, you know, there's always good and bads. And so he's really a man of that time where he has to make decisions, tough decisions, you know, how do I, best operate my business and still treat people fairly. And so, you know, the way I look at it, he saw everything as either, you know, it's, there's a, there's a sense of justice and, and, a, a, and if something isn't, you know, the way it should be for justice sake, there has to be something that remedies that. And obviously that's where the trials and all those decisions were made about the Dakota people. But it's one of those things where it's hard for him, I think, you know, or even us today to look at and, and we can see all the bad things, but there was also a lot of the accomplishments as well. us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.